to whatever young kid wants to listen. Be a star in whatever role you're in. Accept it. Take it seriously. Be great in your role. And that could change your life. Patrick Beverly. The story of Rod Smart, AKA He Hate Me, embodies this quote to perfection. Rod was born in Lakeland, Florida, where he grew up playing football with his cousin, Freddie Mitchell, and maybe watching a little football years later with his younger brother, Chris Rainey. Now, all three of these cats would eventually play in the NFL, but of the three, Rod was the only one that was not drafted. Still, he'd go on to leave the biggest impact on the game of football. Yo, don't forget to like the video if y'all like it and also check out the extensive back catalog we have. We have seven seasons of videos on what happened to your favorite players and ex-players. Also, we post new videos regularly, so subscribe and enable your notification. Now, without further ado, this is what happened to Rod Smart, AKA, he hate me. Chew the wang. So football season is just over the horizon and if you plan to attend any games this year, you can do so using the day's video sponsor, SeatGeek. If you're not familiar with SeatGeek, it's an app that was created to simplify the ticket buying process. That way you can get the best deals in the shortest amount of time. Basically, they aggregate all the tickets from across the web and put them in one place so it's easy to compare. They also grade these tickets on a scale from 1 to 10, pretty much eliminating the chance of you getting duped by an overpriced ticket. If you want to download the SeatGeek app, all you got to do is click the link in the description and don't forget to use my code FLIMLO for $20 off your first purchase. Let's get it. So as I talked about in the intro, Rod Smart comes from a family of athletes. In addition to being a football star, in high school, he was a standout track star as well. On the football field, he was an elusive speedster, racking up yards and touchdowns with ease. The 5'11", 200-pound running back ended up receiving a scholarship offer to play football and run track at the University of Western Kentucky. During his time there, he amassed 2,300 rush yards on 356 carries. That's a six and a half yards per carry average. And Rod peaked at the perfect time, getting a chance to be the full-time starter his senior season. He ran for 1,200 yards and scored 10 touchdowns, which put him top five in all-time single season performances at the school. He graduated with a degree in kinesiology, a study of the mechanics of body movement. This would actually serve him well down the line as he would eventually become a personal trainer. And now that he had his degree in tow, there was nothing to lose by chasing his dream of playing in the NFL. So he entered the draft. He wasn't invited to the NFL combine, but he was said to have run around in 4-3 in an unofficial workout. Given that speed and his versatility as a player, given the fact that he played special teams in college and also his overall production as a college player, it was reasonable to assume that he'd get a shot at the NFL. But as he sat back and watched the 2000 an NFL draft, Rod's name was never called. Shortly after the draft ended, however, he did receive a call from the San Diego Chargers who wanted him to come in for a tryout. Rod was grateful for the opportunity, but it was short-lived. He didn't make the team, and for the first time in his life, he was out of football. The year Rod had believed all his dreams would come true. Actually, it was just the opposite. And for the first time in a long time, Rod wouldn't be playing football at all. But then something new was created, just at the absolute perfect time from Rod's standpoint. The XFL was born. In the spring of 2001, Rod Smart joined the Las Vegas Outlaws of the XFL. If you're watching this video, you guys are most likely pretty familiar with the XFL's initial run, a league built in the vein of pro wrestling where no gimmick was too much. While a lot of the gimmicks fell flat, one that worked unbelievably well was allowing players to put any name, word, or phrase they wanted on the back of their jerseys. Most players weren't thrilled with the antics and never actually embraced the league that they were in. They were mostly just hoping to get picked back up by the NFL or possibly the CFL. Meanwhile, Rod, he bought into the league and he came up with a list of names to use on his jersey. He didn't just come up with one name. His initial plan was to switch names every single week and give you a phrase that would stick out to you. This would be his calling card. But it just so happened that the Outlaws were playing in the XFL's first nationally televised game. And every guy was trying to grab attention and stand out however they could. For game one, Rod went with the first name off of his list. 
He Hate Me. A name that's still synonymous with the league today and the XFL is actually pursuing to trademark that name literally as we speak and they should give Rod some ownership of it because hey, he created it. But that's another story for another day. Here's a quote from Rod explaining the name choice. Basically, my opponent is gonna hate me. After I win, he's gonna hate me. It is what it is. It's a saying I was saying when I'd feel something wasn't going my way. For example, when I was on the squad in Vegas and coach was putting other guys in, if I felt I was better than them, you know, hey, he hate me. See what I'm saying? Give me a chance. That's all I ask. It came from the heart, within, the way I felt. I feel as if everyone hates me, from my mom to my dad, and even my brothers and sisters. Everyone hates me. My buddy Greg Cates always used to use it. So I took it from him. And it's funny because before the explanation, I felt like I knew what it meant. After the explanation, like I'm crazy confused. Like I have, what is he even talking about? The way I always interpreted it came from uh, my homeboy Hank. It was this one cat from the neighborhood that was always trying to compete with him and do different things like that. And he just destroyed this man at every single turn. He was better at every single thing you could think of. And when we was young, like middle school, he used to taunt the dude and be like, damn, bro, you hate me, huh? Yeah, I bet you hate me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so the whole he hate me thing, I, I mean, that's just how I always seen it. Like, oh, bro, I'm so much better than this dude. He gotta hate me. If I was him, I would hate me. You feel me? But anyway, moving on. Bro, immediately after that game, all anybody was talking about was the name. He hate me. It just became a national phenomenon. So Rod wisely scrapped his idea to switch names every week and he just stuck with he hate me. That was it. He had one that ended up becoming the number one selling jersey in the entire league. And other clout chasing players used to even use name flips of his name to try to also get attention. Names like I hate he and I hate he too. Stuff like that. In 2004, Spike Lee even named one of his movies She Hate Me which he admitted was inspired by Rod. So in just that alone, you can see the cultural impact that this name made. Not to mention the fact that the XFL is literally trying to trademark the name right now so that they can use it in the new XFL that's gonna be starting out next year. On the field, he played well. He finished second in the league in Russia. He did that with a total of 800 yards in a 10 game season. He scored three touchdowns on the year and was second on the team in receiving yards despite the fact that he was a running back. The XFL's original run only lasted for one season. When it was all over, that was it for most of the XFL players. But Rod had created something that would live on, in the memories of fans and even in the memories of a few pro teams. After a one game stint in the CFL, Rod signed a deal with the Philadelphia Eagles. He joined the practice squad and A, he was still getting paid to play football. He worked hard, never complained, readjusted to the NFL game, and before the season ended, he made it to the active roster. He only got two carries out the backfield that year, but he played a decent amount on special teams. The following year, he was claimed off waivers by the Carolina Panthers. That season, he played in every single game for them on special teams. This man went from being a star in the XFL to leading the Panthers in special teams tackles during the 2002 season. He just wanted it more than everybody else, used his speed, used his ability, and racked up 24 tackles on special teams alone, again, more tackles than any other Panther player was able to accumulate on special teams. Now, these are the things that I did not know about this man. I thought he was just kind of this little crazy cat who came up with this cool name in the XFL and then, you know, that was it. But he had a really good college career. We know what he did in the XFL and now he's in the NFL leading the team in a very important category after his XFL run. That's crazy, but that ain't it. So in that 2002 season, he was just a gunner but he was a star in his role. He was so much of a star in his role that in 2003, the next year, his role expanded. So in 03, he finished second on the team in special team tackles. Cool, but he was also given the opportunity to return kicks. So now he just went from kickoff and punt to kickoff, punt, and kick return. How was he at kick return? Check it out. He averaged 23 yards per return and racked up 947 yards on the season. Against the Saints, he took one back 100 yards for a TD and blocked a punt in that same year. Now that Carolina team that he played a significant role on 
went 11 and 5 and on february 1st 2004 they played in super bowl 38 versus tom brady bill belichick and the new england patriots so guess who was returning punts in the super bowl this random xfl star he hate me bro now you might not remember because something else very significant happened in that super bowl not during the game at halftime Okay, yeah, we all remember. Rod ended up returning three punts in the game for 74 yards. And regardless, how many people on the planet can say they played in the XFL's first nationally televised game and played in the Super Bowl afterwards? It'd be impressive either way, but it's a lot more impressive the fact that he played in the XFL first after not making the NFL and then played in the Super Bowl after that. And I'm just looking at it like, when you talk about being a star in your role, like, he hate me, bro. He did it. Rod said himself that he was never, in his entire football career, the best player on his team. But still, look what he was able to accomplish. And the best part about it is he adapted to each situation. When he was in college, he played his role. He really waited until his senior year. Then he had a 1,200-yard season. In the XFL, oh, it's time to be an entertainer. He had the highest selling jersey in the entire league and was still good on the field, was second in the league in rushing. Then he comes back to the NFL, they're like, listen, you're not playing running back, bruh. Okay, cool, I'll play gunner. Leads the team in tackles. Every opportunity he got, he made the best of it. And every little role he got, he perfected that role and became a star in it. So to me, that's the real story here. Now, Rod played the next two years with Carolina. Then he was waived as he got a little bit older and injuries started to pile up. Around 2006, he got an opportunity with Oakland, but wasn't able to make the final roster. He was selected in the first AAF, if you will, the All-American Football League. He was drafted in the first round, but they never played a game. So obviously that never materialized. It was at that point that he finally leaned back on his kinesiology degree and became a personal trainer. At that point, for more than a decade, Rod lived a pretty quiet, stable life until just recently. On June 12, 2009, a now 42 year old Rod Smart went missing. Rod's family during this time stated that they were worried about him. They were worried about his safety and his well being. That kind of leads you to believe that there could have been something weird going on before he went missing, but I'd have to take a huge leap to some conclusions because there's just no evidence or no reports of anything that I can even try to piece together here. So let me just give you what happened. On the morning of June 12, 2019, Rod was seen in a restaurant around 10 a.m. He goes to the restaurant, he eats, and then he asks where the restroom is. He then goes to the restroom, sneaks out of the restaurant on a dining dash type move. The woman at the business called the police. They searched, couldn't find Rod. Now again, this was on the 12th. Like the next day, Rod is reported missing. Like, bro, we haven't seen this man. Where is he? In my mind, he's kind of like evading the police over this petty crime. But it wasn't reported that way. It was reported as he just kind of came up missing. But like I say, most of the articles that I read didn't have that little restaurant part in there. Like <laughs> Most of them didn't talk about that, but I mean, apparently that happened. Now, some of the reports also state that he was meeting up with a friend before he went missing, which would definitely explain the heavy concern from his family. If this was a person who they weren't sure they could trust in the first place, and then a member of your family comes up missing, I mean, that's gonna obviously put you in a state of panic. Whatever's going on here is obviously very, very sensitive because the police reports are very vague and a lot of it has been edited and they're just not releasing any real information on what really took place. So Rob was missing from the 12th to the 18th, about a week. On the 18th, the police were able to find him and basically say he was in good condition. They were happy that he turned up. And that seemed to be it. Now, now the actual police reports themselves were heavily redacted before the press got hold to them. So there's a lot of information in there that we don't have. But I guess for now, the important thing is that he went missing. They found him. He's safe. He seems to be good. And, you know, he's back resuming his life. Now, while I will admit that when Rod Smart went missing, this is a couple of weeks ago now, as you can see, um, that's what made me want to do this video. But as I got into the story, that became the least significant part of the whole thing. And I almost want to do like the police reports right now and just redact 
that entire situation because honestly I want to focus on everything that came before that. Throughout his professional career, Rod Smart was given roles that most would find less than appealing. Still, he took all of those roles, made the absolute most of it, and ended up having a pretty damn good pro football career across a couple different leagues. And a guy that admitted himself that he was never the best player on any team he was ever on had a seven year professional career. And a name that he popularized, he hate me will live on forever. That's the video. Wow. Yeah,